Welcome to the Expert Network Team Podcast. Where our goal is to inform and educate our listeners on matters related to finance, legal, insurance, accounting, and other interests that are of personal and business nature. We hope you will find our content useful as well as entertaining. The Expert Network Team consists of Carl Frank of ANI Financial, Mike Miller of Miller and Associates CPAs, Jeff Cromendike of Security First Insurance Agency, and I'm Nathan Merrill. I'm an attorney at Goodspeed and Merrill. Together, our independent team combines our expertise to provide you insights and solutions, some straightforward, some profound, for real-life opportunities we see on a daily basis. We hope you enjoy the information contained in today's podcast and find it useful. If you'd like to learn more or desire to meet with any of the Expert Network team members in person, you can contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's I-N-F-O at expertnetworkteam.com. We encourage you to take advantage of a free consultation with any of our team members. Just mention this podcast when you schedule your appointment. Now on to today's podcast. Hi, Nate. Hi there, Carl. How are you today? I'm good. Welcome to 2021. Oh my gosh. And, you know, recognizing that we ended off last year on a little bit of a light note with our favorite or least favorite phrases and words from 2020... I have a new favorite meme or play on words, and you may have seen this about 2021. I don't know. What is it? Is is it something to the effect of, is it concerning to you that the way you pronounce the current year is 2021? <laughs> no, I haven't heard Meaning this. 2020 was victorious. Ah, uh, yes. 2021. The winner. That's horrible. It did not win. <laughs> Just thought I'd the, start off. The with first that. year of this decade is going to be great, Nate. We're all winners now. I am an optimist. I am an optimist. We all made it. COVID is going to end in 2021. That's my belief. Cool. Yeah, I think so. Hey, our topic today we'll come is come back and visit that at the end of the year and see how accurate you see, are. See, test my forecast. Yeah. Okay, we could do that. I mean, what have I got to lose? You're not predicting the market outcome. You're just predicting COVID I am at this not. point. Not. Yeah, that would be something else. All right. So what are we talking about today? Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021 and what it really means for business owners. There's some wins in here, speaking of winners. So I think, uh, I think it's a great topic for us to dive right into. You know, passed it in, in mid-December. It's a $900 billion stimulus bill. It's got a gazillion things inside of it. Um, enough to trigger anybody, really. <laughs> enough to trigger anybody. You, you know, <laughs> but as I look at this, I'll tell you the one thing that does stand out to me is they learned a little bit, I think, from the first round of PPP, as it were. And this one, uh, this round of it does appear to be a little bit more uh, targeted or maybe surgical in terms of how it's approaching um, affecting relief. And at some level, you know, the libertarian that I am, I can actually support some of the ideas, some of the things they're trying to get through on this. The, the price tag is still astronomical, but... Astonishingly big numbers this year. I remember when um, the entire debt first hit $1 trillion under Ronald Reagan, actually, and my father flipping a gasket because it was such a big number. Now we're talking about this in a single bill. Yeah. Amazing. And it's the smaller of the year. So This world has changed in big ways. Yeah. Well, but you know what? Dude, the comforting thing is my kids that? were paying Monopoly the other day, and you still start out with $1,500. There's been zero <laughs> inflation in Monopoly, in Monopoly money. <laughs> well, hard to imagine, but... I, you know, it might as well be Bitcoin. <laughs> you, it's, That's next. There is a monopoly with a credit card. I don't know if you've seen that. I have not seen that. We must both not really want to talk about this because... PPP loans. Okay. They're actually getting better, like yes. you said. And there's four new ways you can spend your money. So there's PPP round two, um, and there's a downside. You, you, you Not everybody qualifies for it, but uh, you still have to spend 60% of it on uh, payroll, but the other 40%, there's four new categories that, that make a lot of sense. Like you said, a surgical, a little bit of, a little bit more targeted makes more sense. Uh, what are the other categories? Well, covered operations expenditures for software and cloud computing. So if you had to work remote, that makes sense. Well, yeah, and if you had to, like, we've invested a fair amount. Um, we're expanding our usage of, like, Teams, and we've right. developed some tools. Does that cover the hard costs of setting up people remotely, too? It does. Too? Okay. Not bad. Yeah. No, I think that that makes, makes sense. sense. Again, um, 
probably were headed that direction anyway in a lot oh of cases. Gosh, I had a lot of my editing. workforce mm-hmm. that was really pushing to get remote. Right. But this is this is government subsidized efforts in that regard, I did suppose. Did we do one on culture and how hard it is to maintain culture in this remote world? We did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we spent huge. a little bit of time on I that. Think I think we need to get Jeff, our culture guy, back in and do one just on that because that's the biggest downside of working remote. It really is. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. Well, there's another one um, the covered property damage costs. So if you've got any um, damage to your property from the protests this year, uh, that is covered. So it has nothing to do with COVID, except that it happened at the same time as COVID. So that's Do you thing. know if that would also include efforts you took to prevent damage, like the boarding up that folks did? I think that makes perfect sense to me. I, I don't know if it does or not. Let's ask Mike. And then uh, covered supplier costs. So if you've got to make payments to a supplier that even if those payments needed to be made um, uh, for things you received prior to COVID, you can expense it now. And the last one is covered worker protection expenditure. So if you've got somebody who came down with COVID and you got to spend money on them, that's good. So it all makes sense, right? Yep. Yep. You want to talk about the big downside? Uh, the big downside to the new PPP loan. Not everybody gets the new PPP loan. Well, sure. I mean, but this also makes sense and, and I don't begrudge this at all, uh, as, as a business who didn't right. suffer too much during yeah. the, I mean, we, we worked hard. We, we exerted ourselves. Oh my gosh, the stress. So, so it's not because we didn't do things to make, sh- to ensure success, but for businesses that, um, like ours that didn't suffer tremendous right. impact from you don't get COVID. PPP number we two. We don't we we don't get it because nope. we can't prove that it has right. dramatically harmed our business. Right now, that being said, I welcome it for those that have. And you Absolutely. and I were talking about this before we went on the air, which is you know some businesses. Uh, the example that was given in one of the the commentaries that we were reading is like a bull rama, right? Right. I mean, there are some businesses, restaurants entertainment, just hospitality, who have just been hammered Anything by travel this. related. And I, given the nature of the way the government has been behind these shutdowns, right. and it's not just an economic condition, it is, you know, a government mandate, I support the idea, you know, under the takings concept, under the Constitution, that government has some responsibility to restore these people. So I love it. I... I welcome um, that one and and support it. But yes, it won't be open to everybody like it was no. before, which probably will help in the processing issue. You know, a lot of the bad stories you heard coming out of oh PPP1 was mm-hmm. little moms and pops who right. didn't have sophisticated mm-hmm. accounting or payroll. Right. And it just was hard for them mm-hmm. to actually get access to the money. Well, and that's a big deal. And, you know, it, it really does need help to people who need the help. So, right. so if you if your revenues were down quarter over quarter twenty five percent, or this quarter compared to the prior year's same quarter twenty five percent, you can get PPP loan too. Yeah, and the rest of us are out of luck. Yeah, and I don't really view that as a bad thing. So that's why you kind of threw me off with that lead in there. Like, yeah. what's the bad thing? Yeah, yeah, that's the big downside. Not everybody's going to get it, but you know, maybe it's a good thing. Yeah. Another good thing, I think, and I know this to be the case, um, at least for us, those of us who are not on the um, the CPA processing side getting paid for complicated PPP loan forgiveness applications, is that you you took out less than one hundred and fifty grand. What's the good news? Good news is you get the streamlined forgiveness. You basically are just certifying you used it on the right things. Yeah, and you have to keep. There's record keeping involved, so don't just like. Right. Think you sign your name to it and you you move on. You want to keep those records in a nice, you know, safe place. Whether you paper keep them or lock them up in a online cloud storage type place. But four years, I think it's four years. Yeah, and then you're done. And you know what? Uh, if it's a one page loan to get 150 grand, it, it's fantastic. And that that really does go right to mom and pop, doesn't it? Yeah, because they're the ones who are really getting these smaller loans. So. And then I think there's still a modestly uh, abbreviated forgiveness for everybody under $2 million, right? Right. And then above $2 million is where you have the major right. major effort. So most of us are going to be getting that. Yeah. But getting but it's that. nice for those under one fifty to be able to just simply certify, keep the records, four years, but move on. Exactly. And the employees got a little benefits out of it. So uh, unemployment benefits got extended. So there's another 11 weeks for regular unemployment compensation. And then pandemic unemployment compensation got extended another 11 weeks. And then it, you got another 300 bucks per week. So, you know, so for some of our employees, that worked out pretty good. 
Yeah, another thing as it pertains to both the current PPP and PPP1 that I'd like to highlight as well, because I think this was a big... This 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 was creating some anxiety for some folks um, for a number of reasons, but the the expenses associated with obtaining forgiveness have been clarified in this new round. To me, that was the most important thing to come out of the new round of COVID was clarifying what Congress said they intended that the IRS undid by saying uh, under the economic benefit rule, if you get forgiveness and it's not included in income, you don't get the deductions associated with forgiveness, which is a longstanding tax concept. But here, Congress said that wasn't our intent. They fixed it. So now that that original loan and any secondary loan effectively become a tax-free government grant to your business if you qualify for forgiveness. That's a huge win for it business owners. That's yeah. fantastic. And, 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 you know, I just can't imagine being one of these companies, a, a restaurant owner, who didn't get that? I mean, it might be it might be that just the tax bill from their PPP loan would kill them this year, since they're still not able right. to go back to regular business. Well, and you actually prompted the next one. This is one of my favorite additions into this, and I think this is you know when we talk about surgical relief, hundred um, percent meal deductions. Woo-hoo. Yeah, and I like this because. And, and I'm gonna I'm gonna outright promote everybody going to their favorite restaurant as often as they can afford to or permit because right. these folks have been hit the hardest and mm-hmm. and maybe for good reason maybe not for good reason I mean the jury's still out on that in terms of how vulnerable we were at restaurants but no kidding but specifically restaurants and churches you know yeah. were basically shut down while oh. Home Depots and Right and CVSs were left or open. Yeah, right, great, great so comparison. not to target mm-hmm. Costco and Home Depot and <laughs> or Lowe's, anybody else. We but all know I, I worship the you know the power tool aisle as much as I worship the <laughs> church, but um, a little facetiously. Feels there, like but, that sometimes. But no, I, I really like the idea that they they recognize that certain industries have been hit. Restaurants yeah. are obviously one of those huge. So hundred so, percent business related meal deductions yeah. this year at a restaurant or food serviced by a restaurant. And and so maybe there needs to be some clarification on that, but I think it's up to interpretation with your CPA. So sure. if I if I either take in from a restaurant to me, I you know, take out I should say and have it delivered here, that's restaurant food. Right. But maybe I'm a little bit more on the aggressive side. Well, but th- that being said, maybe what I should promote is get out and do your business lunches again. Get, Go get together do it. with your network and with your folks and absolutely chat it up at the uh, the local Absolutely. Yeah. Deductibility of, of meals, deductibility of PPP. I mean, there's a lot of good things. Um, uh, you know, on the personal tax return, there's a couple of wins as well. Sure. So um, if you're a non-itemizer, if you're just filing your simplified 1040, then you know what? You get a win because you can make a charitable tax deduction of 300 bucks regardless. And this year you can make it per person. So if you're a married couple, you can make $600 of charitable deductions for non-itemizers. It's a small amount of money, but if you're not itemizing, it's bigger than you had before. Yeah. Well, when you combine that with some of the checks that are coming out, I mean... Yeah. Um, and then I think there's a couple of other credits in there that we chose to highlight as well. Isn't there an yeah. education tax credit? There's an credit? education tax credit, which is huge. So if you make a married couple under $180,000 you're, and you're paying for education for somebody in your family, um, you get a, an education credit you want to talk to your CPA about and understand how that works as opposed to the deductions that we had before. So right. the deductions went away, but the income limit on the credit went up. And most people will win. Yeah, I'll, t- I'll usually take a credit over deduction any day. I mean, any that's just day, general right? kind of... But that's just you and I being tax geeks. Right, sure. That's just you and I being tax geeks. But, but you know, yeah, but that's... I guess my point is you start adding these things in, like the additional charitable deduction, the tax credit for education expenses. What was the other one you mentioned just before that? The uh, Well, the AGI is a big one, so for healthcare expenses. Okay. The, uh, but that was different. That wasn't a credit. Yeah, but these are all things that flow through to the personal return. Right. So, yeah. so we're seeing a lot of potential enhancements to individual personal tax return profiles. That- yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that's why I mentioned the 7.5% AGI. So if you have big health care expenditures, you're having a rough time. And especially during COVID, a lot of people are. And so if you spend more than 7.5% of your adjusted gross income, that's the big number near the top of your return, then... Um, 
you can actually deduct it. And that didn't used to be the case. It used to be 10%. And then for a few years, there was an age limit on it. Uh, it's back to 7.5%. It's supposed to be permanent. I hope it stays. That's sure. a big win. As we age, our health care expenses go up. So I like really, how you throw them in there. The It's supposed to be permanent. It's supposed to be permanent. Per, used, permanent used to mean permanent, but not in, in modern lexicon, permanent means Holy mostly cow. permanent. After the CARES <laughs> Act, I don't think anything is permanent. But I so digress. So on, on, that, on that same vein, um, oh, FSAs. FSAs, right. So they were going to expire. Many people uh, get an FSA, a flexible spending account, from their employer, and they're supposed to use it or lose it. And if they don't, By the end of the year, right. Right. And if you don't use it for your health care expenditures, by the end of the year, you're, it's gone. But a lot of people couldn't use that in 2020 because of all of the you know, COVID shutdown. You couldn't even go to the dentist. So, right. so they extended that. You could keep it year over year. That's a big win for a small number of people. That means a lot. Yep. And then another big one. Um, this one really stood out to me. Are we going on to the employer paid? Love it. Let's just dive right in. Yeah, this is this is very interesting to me because I, I think in part because you, you want – I mean, I, I work in a – I think we both work in fields where advanced You need degrees, a lot of education. Yeah, you need a lot of education. But even right. – this can be relevant to even people who are in, in more sk- even skilled labor or less – professional services Absolutely. where you want to you want an educated workforce so you want to kind of summarize or do you have that the up? big deal is that education expenses made by the employer can be um, a pre-tax contribution from the employer on behalf of the employee and the employee doesn't have to pay any income tax on it and what changed is but deductible that, to the employer but deductible right so the employer gets to deduct it the employee doesn't have to, have to claim it as income and and now we can do that for the student loans right. that our people are coming in with. And that's a big deal. Right. So instead of giving everybody a $5,000 raise or whatever we're going to give them this year, if they've got student loans, let's just pay off their student loans. Right. We'll just categorize the same check. It and saves them about $2,000 potentially. Right. Well, it's huge. And uh, But here's the deal. We don't even have to pay it off for them. We don't have to write the check. We could if we wanted to to the student loan company, whoever that might be. Mm-hmm. We'll leave the uh, we'll protect the innocent there or the guilty, it, depending on your political persuasion, probably. So you can just write it to your employee as long as the employee turns around and writes a check to pay off the loan. Everything they're paying is income tax free for the employee. It's a win win. Yeah, love it. Now that that is very interesting to me because um, we, do, we ideas. do have some young workforce that. They come in with student loans. Yeah. Well, you run a law firm, for goodness sakes. I can't imagine what law school costs. Yeah. I'm, well, I'm technically still paying off my student loans. Right. So. Well, I mean, at a low it, interest It's usually rate. a lifetime thing. <laughs> but, you know, I, I was reading a thing on that, just a, a final aside on the student loan deal. I mean, any bailouts, especially to, to elite colleges and professional degrees, those are still technically good investments because you, over a lifetime, will reap, right. you know, significant ROI on yeah. those types of degrees, assuming you use them. Right. Where the challenge really exists is for useless degrees, and oh I don't want to get gosh. too... I don't want to trigger too much there, but there are some degrees out there that really don't on a... Consider it a $40,000 a year tuition that you're never going to get ROI Even $40,000 a year of income. But we'll be of. bailing out those folks as well. I, I mean, it's applied uniformly, which is fine. If it's going to be a education credit and we call everything education, then fine, but... Um, no, that's exactly right. And I, and I know that there are benefits that are paid from higher education that far exceed the financial remunerations that yeah. we get from it. And we can't just base it off of how much money a person makes to decide whether it was a good decision. But in the real world, money is a survival skill. Right. And it matters. Well, I think you said in this, you know, we were also looking at the summary of what the yeah, what, what the some bill of the other expenditures the are, not just the tax incentives and the the things we've discussed, but there is $82 billion for education funding. Yeah, it's uh, huge. 54 of that going to K-12 through 12 and 23 going to colleges and universities. So right. it's not like they're getting left high and dry either. They're definitely so. not getting left <laughs> high and dry. There's a lot of money being spent in this bill. Oh, my goodness. And that $900 billion, uh, you know, it includes $35 billion for wind, solar, and other clean energy, too. I mean, you know, it's all over the place. It's, it's a it's, big it's, bill. It's still a bit of a typical grab bag for Congress. The which, Consolidated Appropriations Bill of 2021. Going to bite my tongue on that. <laughs> it's huge. It's huge. Well, we covered a lot. Yeah, no, th- this is certainly... He- here's the most uh, disconcerting part of this conversation is we have only touched 
what do you call it, scrape the surface? I yeah, mean, there's so much. Scrape this the is not to be considered comprehensive by any means, nope. but uh, Carl and I kind of went through and highlighted things that we think are going to be interesting to the types of folks that we work with, types of questions we've been getting yep. leading up to this CAA of 2021. It's exactly they, they really what didn't I name it that well. No. They didn't spend a lot of time on the Not name. on the acronym. No. They finally got it done, though. <laughs> they spent $900 billion. Good grief. You think they could buy a good acronym for $900 <laughs> billion? Dollars? With all the lawyers that would w- end one, in this? At least $1 million to a consultant to come up with a good name for the act. You know, <laughs> What's a million dollars? On that note, um, welcome to 2021. 2020 did not win. It's just 2021. A happy New Year. Bye. Thank you for joining us today. Hope you enjoyed the information we shared. If you enjoyed this podcast, please feel free to share it with someone else and join us next time. If you want to meet with a member of the team, please contact us at info at expertnetworkteam.com. That's info at expertnetworkteam.com. If you have special topics you'd like to hear about, please reach out to us and let us know at the same email address. Again, that's info at expertnetworkteam.com. Thank you for joining us and have a great day. Thank you for listening to this podcast. We want to remind you that listening to this podcast does not establish a client professional relationship with any of the firms represented, nor does it constitute legal investment or accounting advice, and the views are those of the professionals only. Investment advisory services may be provided through ANI Financial Services, and securities may be provided through Genios Wealth Management.